Pentecost Sunday. But to some people, if you say the word Pentecost, half the church, <laughs> our shorts get tight. Because Pentecost is the, it's the birth of the church. It's the most exciting day, really. I mean, it's the birth of Jesus, amazing. The death of Jesus, terribly sad. The resurrection of Christ, hallelujah. And then Jesus said, it is expedient for you that I go away. I don't want you to do anything. I want you to go into Jerusalem and wait in the upper room until you be endowed with power. Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2 is where we're going to be speaking today. And I pray in the name of Jesus that you would open your hearts to the word of Yahweh, that you would open your minds, and if you have any preconceived taught things that you think you know, or someone told you, like someone said, there are people that teach that miracles don't happen anymore. Really? You know how long I'd stay under the teaching of someone like that? Take a breath. That's it. If we don't have the Holy Spirit, I'm out of here because I can't do anything for you and you can't do anything for anybody else. Only he can do things through us. And so Acts chapter 1, and he says, as I just said, be, uh, verse 4, being assembled with them, he commanded them, do not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise which you have heard of me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said, it is not for you to know the times and the dates which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and the ends of the earth. It's interesting because it's, it's, it's ironic that the baptism of the Spirit divides the church, and, and absolutely it was the opposite is why he came. The Holy Spirit came to bring us unity. They were all together of one accord. So we have churches out there that say, well, we don't believe the Holy Spirit does these things anymore, and so we do, we're not family. Or we believe, you know, it's nonsense. Satan has tried to use the Holy Spirit to divide the church. The one vessel, the one being who has empowered us to go forward and do the things that we've been called to do has become, by Satan and by a lot of churches, an instigator. Bring up the gifts of the Spirit and the baptism, people get nervous, like I said. But in the New Testament, it tells us we need the Holy Spirit. Listen to what Martin Lloyd-Jones, he was one of my favorites. He was a preacher in the Reformed theology in England, and this is what he said. He would not be considered a charismatic or a Pentecostal, full gospel person, but listen to what he said. I want to talk to you about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You may call it what you want, but I want you to know have you experienced the fullness of the Spirit? I know all of you listening to me come as from Reformed background, as I do, but it's not enough. I know that all of you would want to say to my question about the Holy Spirit, well, we got it. We got all at conversion. There's no need for any more experience. Well, said Martin, Lo Martin Lloyd-Jones, I have only one question for you. If you got it all at conversion, where in God's name is it? It's the truth. You know, this Chinese missionary came to America, and he spent about a year here in America. And when he back, went back to China, they said, what impressed you the most about the American the church? And the man said, what impressed me the most about the American church is the amount of things that they can do without the Spirit of God. Because America's wealthy. We can buy things. We can do all kinds of things. But the church was not sent to become a, a carnal entity. We're not supposed to be doing things in our flesh. We're supposed to be led by the Spirit. The only way I can possibly be used by Yahweh to touch your spirit is as if His Spirit is in me. 
speaking through me. Not just here, but one-on-one -on -one when you're talking with somebody. Yesterday at the store, some guy I'd never seen him before was in the store shopping, and he confessed to me later after I got a chance to talk to him and I got a chance to minister to him. It was no accident. He said, I have to tell you something. I was kind of grumbling that my wife came, made, me, made me come to the thrift store. But I had a chance to put a word on that guy, and it really touched his heart. It was a divine appointment. Because when you move in the Spirit of God, you're open to what He says. And every day is an opportunity for you to share Christ with somebody. Now, I don't get up this morning, I don't even pick them. Sometimes people walk right by me, I don't say nothing. But there are times when the Holy Spirit puts people on my heart, and I just speak right up. If you worked at that store, you know I'm not telling you a lie. So, provision. When Jesus was about to leave physically on the earth, He said, I'm going to leave, but the Spirit of Yahweh would come. In fact, it's interesting to me that these people did not realize it was absolutely critical that the Spirit of God came into the church. If the Holy Spirit's not in the church, we don't have a church. We're the body of Christ, the believers. But where's the Spirit? You see my body, but you can't see my Spirit. My Spirit is in here. The real me is the spirit. The real church is the spirit of God in the church. It's not a bunch of people just trying to get through life as best as we can carnally. That's not how we're supposed to do it. We're supposed to be men and women of the spirit. So he told him, wait for the promise. Wait. Don't do anything. This is not, he's not talking about a gift of salvation here. It's, it's totally different than salvation. In the book of uh, John, chapter 20, after Jesus rose from the dead, he was around the disciples and he said to them, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. But they had not yet received him to the full amount. But that was pretty powerful that he spoke that over his people. Jesus had already given the Holy Spirit following the resurrection. The new covenant was effect in them. This experience in the upper room was not about conversion. It was about provision. I got converted when I gave my life to Jesus, but now I need power. You shall receive power. That word in the Greek is dunamis. It means dynamite. That's where we get our word dynamite. You shall receive power from on high after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. We've got churches all over this country and all over the world where the Spirit of God is not running the show. We run churches like corporate entities. We have board meetings, and it seems to me like a lot of the elders and the deacons are people who are influential because they have big bank accounts, not because they have a big spirit of God living in them. That's what we need. We need the Lord. There's a word in John 14, 14, um, what is it, 14 and 26, I believe. The word was where we get a word called parakletos. It comes from a Greek word. It's in the Greek, paraclete. When in the Greek army, they always sent their soldiers out two by two. That way, if you got into a skirmish, you'd, you'd back up to each other, and I'd have your back, and you'd have my back, or else we'd turn towards, and I could see you, you could see me. That's what it was. The word parakletos means one who is called alongside of you, and when the Holy Spirit came into our lives, he's the one called alongside of us, John 16, uh, John 14, 16, 26. The Holy Spirit is our battle partner. He is here to help us get through this life and to make us victorious. It's not enough just to be saved, people. Because say, okay, I'm saved. I'm going to sit on my hands and do nothing. No, we're supposed to make disciples of all nations. I can't make disciples without Him. There are times when I, just like yesterday, I get a chance to speak to people and I know things about them that I, there's no way in the world I could know. And then when I say something to these people, and they know they've never seen me before, they know something's going on other than this world. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He gives you messages for people. He is the active one. He's the one who touches their hearts. He's the one who loves them. He's the one who gives me the words to speak to them or gives you the words to speak to people. It's all about him. It's not about me. Jesus would not send us out without power. He told us to go make disciples of all nations. And so we got all these churches. They don't, 
Okay, go make disciples. How can I make disciples without the Holy Spirit? How could I possibly do it? How can anybody do it? Anybody who says the Spirit of God left long ago, they're nuts. I'm telling you, and I'll tell it to their face. Watch the video. Replay it, because I don't know how in the world we could think we could function without Him. In the book of Acts, chapter 6, or excuse me, what was it? But maybe it was 6. There were so many people coming to Christ that the... The apostles decided there were so many people, they were feeding them, they were serving them and what have you, and they decided, you know, we can't be serving tables here. We need to be preaching the gospel and, and leading people to Christ, praying for the sick and these things. So they chose seven men full of the Holy Spirit to serve tables. In the first century church, you had to be filled with the Holy Spirit just to serve tables. And here we think we can be board members on churches without the Holy Spirit. Why do you think we go to the hospital? We don't go to the hospital to say goodbye to people. We go to the hospital to pray for the sick, anoint them with oil. That's what the Bible says we're supposed to do. Sometimes people come to me and they say, well, I've got cancer or whatever. They said, well, I said, do you go to church? Yeah. Have you called for your elders to pray for you? They don't do that. Breaks my heart. Why don't we do that? We've been called to be his hands and his feet to touch these people with his power with his word. We need the Holy Spirit. To me, he's everything. He's everything. He is the spirit of the living God dwelling in us. Isn't that amazing? When you have the spirit of, of Yahweh dwelling in you, you're not out there chasing girls, smoking dope, doing all the stupid things that we do that get us in trouble, you don't even want to do that because the Spirit of God is moving you. He's showing you where to go, what to do, what to say, how to say it. But when you're in charge, take a day off. Man, I don't feel like sharing the gospel with people today. I've done enough. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I tell people more about Jesus than anybody. I know I'm, I'm on that, that flesh. But when the Spirit of Yahweh is in you, you never get tired of sharing him because it's not you who's sharing him. It's he who's in you, who's greater than he that's in this world. Pentecost is the greatest, greatest day of the church. It was the birth of the church. Here's these apostles up in, up in the upper room. Their master, who they've been with for three and a half years, has now been crucified. And they're scared. And they're hiding in the upper room. Peter. James, John, these guys are hiding because they didn't want to get caught because if they got caught, maybe they'd be crucified. But then suddenly, something happened. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Whew. It's hot up here. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like a mighty rushing wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting there appeared unto them tongues of fire being distributed and resting on each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Hallelujah. So here are these guys scared to death, hiding in the upper room, and suddenly the Spirit of Yahweh falls. Not only does he fall, but he makes sure everybody in Jerusalem knows, hey, it's right here. The whole people, everybody hears it. There's a rush of a mighty wind, and it falls on that house. And then suddenly, when the Spirit comes, these ordinary Galileans are speaking in languages that there's no way in the world they could ever know. They didn't know these languages. They were praising God, and people all over Jerusalem heard it. And they came and said, how is it that these men are speaking these languages. Parthians, Medes, Eliamites, people from Mesopotamia, people from all over the world, they're hearing these uneducated men praising God in their own language. Absolute miracle. There was no more hiding. And so this Peter that was hiding just a few hours before, when all these people came rushing, they started making fun of them. They said, these men are drunk. And Peter said, they're not drunk. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. This is what Peter said happened. Verse, chapter 2, verse 17. 
This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel in the book of Joel 2, 28 through 32. In the last days, he says, says Yahweh, I will pour out my spirit on all your sons and your daughters. They shall prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my men servants and maid servants, I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show them wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth below. Blood and fire and vapor and smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. See all the blood moons we've had? Before the great and the glorious day of the Lord comes. And whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. This is now. In the last days. Now even if you didn't believe the Spirit was moving in the times up till now. These are the last days, people. And he said, in the last days, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all peoples. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. See, you, brothers. You're not mad, are you, Steve? <laughs> Thank you. He says, I got to leave early for church. I got to go somewhere else. I said, just don't stop out or I'll embarrass you. <laughs> see you, guys. Why do I pick on people? Look here what happened. Yeah, they see anointed. Yeah, God has a sense of humor. Each person in that upper room was touched. There was a flame for every head. He said he feel it, the spirit fell on each one of them. And there's still a flame for every head now in the church. As believers, we should want the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to them who ask? I mean, you can go to churches and people can speak in tongues back and forth, do all this stuff, then they walk out and they're trying to make date with the neighbor's wife and doing all this stuff. That ain't the Holy Ghost. That's nonsense. That's flesh on parade. But I believe in the gifts of the Spirit, every one of them. You know when the Spirit of God is moving, you feel it in your hearts when somebody speaks to you that it's moving in the Spirit. You feel it even here today. You don't even have to tell me. You say, I know, yes you do. Because I feel it. The Bible says where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am. He's absorbing our space. He's sharing our space with us. Hallelujah. So we need the Spirit. The experience before Pentecost was day and night. They went from being afraid to being bold. They went from being afraid to die. You know why? Because they were no longer afraid to die. When the Spirit of God comes into your heart, you're not afraid to die. Because you know. <laughs> He's in here telling you it's all true. It's all true. Heaven is your destiny. Do the things I've called you to do. Fire made the difference. So that's the thing. We have churches today that are, have no fire. Peggy always tells me, you pick on churches all the time. I do. I don't really mean to, but I do because we can't have churches with no fire. The Bible says that people are lukewarm. He said, I'd rather you be cold or hot. Nothing's worse than lukewarm. You ever drink lukewarm water when you're thirsty? Blech. Well, that's what the Bible says. That's what God's going to do, spew out of his mouth. We need fire. And it's hard to preach on fire when you're sitting on a block of ice. And we've got churches out there who have no fire in their spirit because the Spirit of God is not running the show. I don't have to prepare messages. I've got all these notes. I'm not even using them. Because he gives me the messages all the time. Sometimes, I, I think sometimes I could just come down here and say, hey, what do you guys want to hear about today? Pick, give me a scripture. And he'll give me what I need to say because that's how he operates. We don't have to worry. I don't sweat. This man from Africa, Uma, told us, you know, I believe in serving God without sweating. In other words, I don't pine. Oh, what am I going to say to these people? What if they think it's a stupid message? What if they think I couldn't care less? Because it's not my message. It's his message. If you don't like it, talk to my boss. Fire makes a difference. Fire makes a difference. The church today, you know, some churches today are so cold, it's like trying to make a roast in a, in a freezer. You can't do it. We need the fire of God. Why do I say fire? Because look what happened. 
fire came upon them. Fire is one of the symbols of the Holy Spirit. Fire, oil, water, wind, Spirit of God. Nothing stops fire. Nothing stops wind. Nothing stops water. Isn't that something? Nothing stops it. Flood coming, pack it up. Fire coming, pack it up. Wind coming. You can't stand it. The f- Yahweh is so powerful and His Spirit's in us. Why tongues? Why do they speak with different tongues? There's different types of tongues. I'm not going to go into all that today, but the, what they saw on the day of Pentecost was they were speaking languages that they could not speak. I read of a situation many years ago of John G. Lake was a man of God over in South Africa. And during one of their services, one of their South African people in the church kind of fell into a trance and started speaking in a very funny language. Stood there for three days in the same spot speaking whatever they were speaking, gibberish. Most people think. Until three days later, this man came through who happened to be from China and he understood everything he was saying. And you know the Chinese don't just have one Chinese language. They got many dialects. This guy was speaking that person's dialect, praising the name of Yahweh, glorifying Jesus Christ. Supernatural. And then we also see in Paul speaks in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, he speaks about prayer language. Tongues as being a, 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 a prayer language between you and Yahweh. It's not a language that anybody on earth understands because it's a heavenly language, but he understands it, and your spirit understands it. There are times, it says in, in uh, Romans 8, when you just don't even know what to pray, and he says, then the spirit comes upon you and prays with groans unutterable. There's times when you just don't even know what to say, and the Holy Spirit can communicate. I'm giving you a lot today, but I want you to know it's real. And these are the last days. Why do we need to speak that language? I read about a pastor who, whose copier at his church broke. And so he called this copier company, and he tried to explain everything, what was going on with the copier. And the guy on the other end at the copier repair shop was thinking, he's not making any sense because he didn't speak the copier's language. You ever try to talk to somebody who who's into computers and you're not? <laughs> talk about talking in tongues. <laughs> it's like... Boom, boom, boom. But so then they finally, they, since this guy couldn't speak their language, they sent somebody down there. Then the guy looked the copier over. Then he calls the office and he told him everything they needed because he spoke their language. That's what it is when the Spirit comes. Paul said, I thank God that I pray in tongues more than you all. Now, Paul wasn't going around speaking Parthians, Methodists. No, he was speaking heavenly language. This comes through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We need the Spirit of God. And if you believe, like, there were no miracles now, again, that scripture there in in Acts chapter 2 says, In the last days I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. We are what? All flesh. All flesh. He didn't say some. The believers, followers of Christ, will be empowered to bring forth the message of the gospel in such a way that even children can understand. To me, that's New Testament prophecy, to be able to proclaim the gospel in a way that anybody can understand it. That is a gift of the Spirit. So we need the Holy Spirit. People, too many Christians see the baptism of the Holy Spirit as an option, and it's not an option. You know, when you buy a car, "Ah, I'd like to have three seats and I'd like to have double. (laughs) You don't order from God. It's not an option. We need him. It's an essential. Jesus asked the apostles and disciples, wait for the promise. And on the day of Pentecost, they were all filled. In the book of Acts chapter 10, Peter came to a Roman's house, an enemy of, of the Jews, And he starts sharing the gospel with Cornelius and his whole house. And the spirit of Yahweh fell on the whole house. And when they heard him speaking in tongues like they did on the day of Pentecost, someone said, hey, let's get these guys baptized. And they baptized the whole house. There's water outside today. If any of you are feeling that you're ready to give your life to Jesus today, come to Christ. 
beg his mercy and be baptized into Christ Jesus. Be baptized signifying be, you're, you're dying with him in death. The word baptism means to bury. So that's why we bury him. That's why we don't just sprinkle him in the water. We bury him under the water signifying they died with Christ and when they come out of the water signifying you're in a new life with Christ. There's little doubt that the disciples were radically changed after they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It is a gift, but it is essential. We need the Spirit of God. The church needs the Spirit of God. You need the Spirit of God. I need the Spirit of God. It's not as a matter of want. It's need. Because I can't do anything without Him. Father has sent me over these years, I've been a Christian 35 years, into situations that I never thought I would be into. I've had to tell children their mother was killed. I've, had to, I've been put into situations and I thought, Lord, why would you put me into this? I'm not ready for this. But every time when the rubber meets the road, he gave me what I needed. One time I, was, I asked my pastor... Ralph Marins, I said, hey, if you ever need any help with hospital calls, call me. I'd like to do one for you. Ralph's a great brother, but I was kind of a radical. Ask Roger in those days. So he, he probably was wondering, I don't know if I want to call Steve or not. He, who knows what he's going to do? So he calls me, and he says, hey, there's a guy from our sister church down in Lincoln, and he was driving up here in Omaha, and he got in an accident on the interstate, and they took him over to University of Nebraska Hospital. Would you go visit him? Sure, hallelujah, you know. I grabbed my Bible. And this is back when the university was under heavy construction. So, I mean, just to get into the emergency room was not easy. So I get there, and I walk in, and I got my Bible under my arm. I'm ready to do business. I said, uh, yes, I'm here to see Joe. I can't remember his last name. W what room's he in? Oh, he's in room 13. So I thought, hallelujah. I'm going to go pray for this guy. And, he's, and I walk in there, and there's a sheet over his head. He's dead. And I'm thinking, okay. I didn't have the courage or even the insight to even pray for him after that. But then I go out into this waiting room, and his family starts showing up. And they're joking. He was a big fella. Oh, he's probably had three meals already. <laughs> they're all laughing. And, and here I'm sitting there. And I'm the only one who knows the rest of the story. And they all kept coming. You know what? I was thinking, exit left, stage right. Bam. I couldn't do any more. <laughs> what am I going to do? But the Lord wouldn't let me move. I wanted to go, but he wouldn't let me move. So finally the doctors come out. And I wasn't, the empty tomb wasn't going on in the, yet. But the doctors come out, and there's like 12 of them. And they're all laughing. A nice family really loved this guy, you know. When can we see him, you know? And nobody's saying nothing to him. And because of construction, we've got to walk through this long hallway and finally into this room. And, and the doctor says, Pastor, would you come with us? <laughs> I didn't want to go. Hamana, 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 hamana. So we get down there, and we walk into this room, and they take me in, and then the doctor, doctor flies over, drops the bomb, and leaves, and I'm the only one there. And I was praying every step, Lord, please, what am I doing here? Please give me something to say to these dear people. And I don't even know what I said, but I said something. And then I remember a, a month later, we were at Church of Calvary, and Ralph had read a very nice letter that they wrote about the nice young man that they sent, that Calvary sent over to say exactly what they needed to hear when their loved one was killed. Only God could do that. I was panicked. I was scared. But when the Holy Spirit steps over, fear leaves. Fear leaves. I want the Holy Spirit. I want him more every single day, and you should want him. You should need him. We'll get you up here to talk one of these days and tell us about what happened, brother. So today, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're lost. If you don't know Jesus, if you've not been saved, if you've not come to him through repentance and faith, you don't know Jesus. You know who he is, 
but you don't know him intimately as your Lord and Savior. You need to know him. Come to Jesus today. Have your sins forgiven. He'll forgive you of your sins today. That's why he went to the cross. And then when you have your sins forgiven, be baptized in water, signifying that you are choosing to live your life for Jesus the rest of your days. And then pray and hunger for the baptism or the fullness of the Spirit, whatever you want to call it. I want to be so filled with the Spirit that glory's coming out my ears. Because without Him, we can do nothing. If there's anyone in this room and say, you know what, I've broken God's heart. I'm so sick of living with guilt. I'm so sick of living with shame. I have broke God's heart. I've hurt too many people. And I just don't know how to find any peace. Let me tell you, the way to peace is Jesus Christ. If you'd come to Christ today, he'll forgive you of your sins. Come by faith. He's here. You don't see him. I don't see him. But I know. I don't think. I know he's here. And if you come to Christ today, he will forgive you of your sins and he'll set you free. And he'll make you a new creation. The person you see here today is not the person I always was. I didn't love people. I didn't even like people. He changes you. The Spirit of God comes in and he begins to make changes. Ah, let's get this. That's like, phew, phew, this has got to go. This has got to go. This, nah, nah, we don't need that no more. That's what he does. Is there anyone in this room who said, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to have my sins forgiven. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. You know nobody's here by accident. Nobody's here by accident. Father knew before the foundation of the world you two girls were going to be sitting here. Who else is? Anybody else? Is the Holy Spirit speaking in your heart? Is there anybody who wants to be changed? Anybody want to be touched by the power of heaven today and be filled with the Spirit of God? That's what he wants to do for you. Maybe you've been a Christian for a long time, but you're a backslider and you're just kind of going through the motions. If you're ready to say, I'm done with that old Christian walk, I want, I want fire. I want to live for Christ. If that's your prayer, stand to your feet. I'm going to pray for you. The Lord's going to do something wonderful. Judy's going to sing. But I would just want you to stand while she sings. I want more of his spirit, more of his glory, more of his power. Just like what we sang, more love, more power. I can't love people more without him. Amen. God bless you, brother.